James chapter 1. I'm going to read verse 17 and 18. Every good and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness nor shadow of turning. In other words, God never changes even one iota and of his own will everybody say his own will of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creation so father we thank you for this word unveil the truth to us today lord lead us and guide us by your Holy Spirit in Jesus name so of course today we're acknowledging Christmas the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ now, Jesus is the only person in human history that we celebrate both his birth and his death and certainly the only person we celebrate his resurrection on Christmas Day, we celebrate his birth. On Good Friday, we celebrate his death. And on Easter, we celebrate his resurrection. And next, we're going to celebrate his coming. Amen? Amen? To catch us up in the air to be with him. What do you say about Christmas? I always have to ask myself and the Lord that question. You know, this is my 39th Christmas message. And I was looking back over some of my past messages. And uh, a couple of things struck me. In 2018, the day before my Christmas message, the Lord said to me, says, the birth of Christ was the beginning of the end now let me remind you that God knew the end before the beginning and Christ was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world which was before the beginning so we know that his birth was planned before the foundation of the earth and we know that he came at just the right time and we know he's coming again at just the right time. Even though he became a man 2,023 years ago, that was planned before the foundation of the world was laid. God planned his virgin birth. God planned that he would reveal the Father. God planned that he would undo the works of the devil. God planned his sacrificial death for our sins. God planned his resurrection. He planned his ascension. And he planned to send the Holy Spirit to live in born again men and women. And that was all part of God's plan which he began to implement. And Christmas was the beginning of the end. The birth of Christ. So think about that. Think about how great God is. And, you know, the Bible says, if God be for you, who can be against you? But this morning I want to say to you, be sure you're with God. Amen? If God be for you, who can be against you? But you better be sure in these last days that we're with Him because, you see, if... Christmas 2,023 years ago was the beginning of the end, then we're much closer to the end than we were. God had a plan. He knew what would happen in the Garden of Eden. He wasn't a surprise to him. He knew what Satan would do. He knew what Adam and Eve would do. But he planned to take what the devil meant for evil and turn it for good. That's what God does. His plan was to give us everything he gave to Adam, plus give us his life and make us his children. His plan was for the word of God to become flesh and live a sinless life. 
so that he could redeem man because man could not redeem himself. Justice demanded the penalty for man's sin be paid, but man could not pay it. So Christ had to become a man. The birth of Christ was the beginning of the end of Satan's rule over man. It was the beginning of the end of man's separation from God. The beginning of the end of sin ruling over man. It was the beginning of the end of the curse of the law. It was the beginning of the end of this present evil age. And it was the beginning of the end of spiritual death. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 7, in verse 13, 750 years before the birth of Christ, God announced some things about him. It wasn't the first announcement of his coming, but it was specific. You know, God never does anything without first saying it. God, he said, surely God will do nothing on the earth without revealing it first to his prophets. And what does a prophet do? He speaks it. God speaks to a prophet and the prophet speaks it. Well, Isaiah was a prophet. And in Isaiah chapter 13, verse 14, he said, The Lord himself will give you a sign. People say, why was he born of a virgin? It's a sign. Some people say, well, it had to do with the blood. You know, no. A baby doesn't have the mother's blood or the father's blood. The baby has his own blood. So he was, she, he was born of a virgin as a sign that this was something supernatural. He said, the Lord himself will give you a sign and behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. So God declared that. It was planned from the foundation of the world. He said in Micah chapter 5 verse 2 that uh, he would be born from the tribe of Judah and he would be born in Bethlehem. He told Isaiah that his name would be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. Then in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, God gave us some wonderful words. He said, for unto us, that means you, unto us, for us, Jesus was born for you, for unto us, not unto God, but unto us. A child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called. So up to that time, that was God's part. This is now our part. His name shall be called. Who's going to call his name? Well, it's up to us. His name shall be called Wonderful. God must want you to call him Wonderful. His name shall be called Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. That's our part. He's Mighty God, the Prevailing or Conquering God is what that word means. The Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. You know, that word peace is the same word as salvation in the Greek. But as the song said this morning, we not only should call him Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace, but we should also call him Lord. He was the beginning of the end. In the winter of 2020, the Lord said to me, Abraham worshipped God. You know, Abraham was the most important person in the Old Testament. In fact, the New Testament says he was the father of us all. And we are to follow his faith. Well, part of his faith was he worshipped God. You know, if you don't worship God, you're not practicing faith. Abraham was not just a man who heard from God, although he was a man who heard from God. He was not just a man who obeyed God. And, you know, he obeyed God in some marvelous ways. You know, when he was still 
in Ur of the Chaldeans, God said to him, Get thee out from among this people to a place that I will show you. So he had to call it the moving van, and they said, Where are we going? He said, I don't know, but let's go. That's faith. He walked with God. He obeyed God. He was a man of faithful faith. He was called the friend of God. But if you read the book of Genesis, you'll find out that Abraham built altars to worship God. You know, we all know in speaking about what's revealed to us in the book of Matthew and Luke about the birth of Jesus, we all know that God revealed his coming birth to three wise men from the east. They weren't Jews, but they were wise enough to follow that star to Jesus, and they said, we've come to worship him. You know, several years ago, there was a big planned event, and they had statewide, and they handed out bumper stickers, and I remember putting one on my car, and it said, wise men still seek him. But do wise men worship him? That's the question. What are you going to do when you find him? Wise men seek him. What are you going to do when you find him? Well, Jesus told us in John chapter 4, God seeks worship. Isn't that something? God seeks something from you. We all seek things from God, and God's always blessed us. Every good and perfect gift came from God. Some of them you didn't seek, some of them you did, but they came from God. But the Bible says, God seeks those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. So Abraham was a worshiper and we're to follow in his steps. Hebrews 12, 26 says, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, yet once more I will not only shake the earth, but also the heavens. Well, that hadn't happened yet, but it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And if you look around and know what's going on, it could happen soon. But he tells us what to do about it. He said, and this word yet once more signifies the removing of those things which are shaken as of things that have been made so that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, therefore, that's what are we going to do about it? What does God want you to do about what's coming upon the earth? He said, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken... A lot of people think there's a shaking going on, but I'm going to tell you it's not going on in the kingdom of God. If you're feeling the ground move under your feet, then you're get, get out of that, get your feet out of that kingdom. Amen. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot, and if it cannot, it will not be shaken. What are you going to do about it? Let us have grace. Grace is not just unmerited favor. Grace is God's ability. If it was unmerited favor, you wouldn't have to say, let us, he wouldn't say, let us have it. You'd already have it. Wouldn't you? Yeah, you'd already have it if you didn't have to merit it. The Bible says, come boldly to the throne of grace that you may receive grace to help. So grace is to help. But you've got to come boldly. You've got to ask for it. And we have, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. There's an acceptable way to serve God, and it's not with the traditions of men and the foolishness of religious trappings. It's with reverence and godly fear. Who's it acceptable to? True worship may not be acceptable to some people, but it's acceptable to God. True worship is one way we serve God acceptably. With reverence and godly fear, the world is being shaken by ungodly fear. But godly fear is reverence for God. You know, in the book of Revelation, when 
God opened up the heavens to John, the very first thing John saw in heaven was the throne of God. And he said around the throne, he saw 24 thrones. And then he saw living creatures around God. And each one of these were angels. And each one had six wings and were full of eyes. And they had no rest day and night. Apparently they didn't need any. And they had no rest day and night from saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And when, those, when they did that, the 24 elders fell down on the ground and they cast their crowns in front of the throne and worshipped him. 24 elders, think about that, of all the people that have ever lived with God, Old Testament, New Testament, there's only going to be 24 elders. And what are they going to be doing? They're going to be worshiping God. And I'll guarantee you, they knew how to worship God before they got to heaven. Or they would never have been qualified to be elders. Amen. I'm just reminded, you know, Norval Hayes, who was a passed on now, but he was a great man of God in his day. And in his latter years, he spoke primarily about worship. Because God took him to heaven and he talked to him about worship. And he used to say this, he said, God will do anything for a worshiper. Amen. So after the church is taken up to heaven and the great tribulation is drawing to a close... God sends angels to proclaim his message to the, the earth. You know, angels don't preach the gospel now, we do. But when we're gone and in heaven, God's going to send angels. And in Revelation ch chapter 14, verse 6 says, And I saw another angel flying in midheaven, having the everlasting gospel to those who dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. So he preached the gospel, but then he said, with a great voice, fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment is come and worship him who made the heaven and the earth. So I'll tell you what, God is still seeking worshipers and we're to worship him. The Lord told Brother Hagin, he said the charismatic people knew a little, know a little back then. He said, know a little about praise and worship and almost nothing. Excuse me. He said, they know a little about praise and almost nothing about worship. People get excited with praise and, you know, can even get in the flesh. But you can't worship God in the flesh. Amen. And then a man by the name of A.W. Tozer, who passed away in 1963, was a kind of a hard, many people considered him a prophet. And he said this, It's certainly true that hardly anything, this is 1963, it's much more so today, because we, we have much bigger, grander churches today. <coughs> he said, it's certainly, at least inside, it's certainly true that hardly anything is missing from our churches today except worship. Yeah, that's what he said. It's certainly true that hardly anything is missing from our churches today except the most important thing, worship. He said, worship of the loving God is always man's reason for existence. He went on to say the Christian church exists to worship God first of all. Everything else must come second or third or fourth or fifth. John MacArthur, who many people follow, said this, 
evangelicals have been playing a kind of pop culture trivial pursuit for decades and have all but lost sight of the glory and grandeur of the one we worship. You know, in the Bible, when anyone saw the Lord or even an angel, they were struck by the glory and grandeur and they worshipped. What does the Bible say? Well, we just saw the Bible said, God is the Spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. You know, but in the book of Revelation, before God let John see into heaven, He dictated seven letters. And He said, Write thus and such to each of the seven churches. And to the church of Laodicea, he said this. He said, I know your works, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm and neither hot or cold, I will spew you out of my mouth. Well, certainly hotness or coldness is evident in our worship. Come on. Amen. I really don't know how else you would know. And you know, God, Jesus Christ, warned people about what's coming on the earth. You know, everybody knows, he said, there'll be wars and rumors of wars and there'll be earthquakes and plagues and famines in various places and many false prophets will arise but then he said but the love of many will grow cold well we know there's different words in the bible for love in the greek language although they're all translated pretty much the same in english but that's the word agape and the only ones that have agape are born-again Christians. So he's saying that because iniquity or violence will abound on the earth, the love of many will grow cold. Certainly, we've never seen a time in our lifetimes when such things are going on as they're going on today. Let me just read it to you. Matthew 24, 7, For nation will rise against nation. And kingdom against kingdom. What's, what's that? That's an ethnic kingdom. The word is eth ethnos. Ethnic, one ethnic, ethnic group against another. And there shall be famines, pestilence, and earthquakes in various places. The devil wants division. And these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended and betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness to the nations. And then the end. What is the gospel? It's the gospel of peace. The Bible says we're to sh one of the armor of God is to sh shod our feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Today, it's not easy to walk in love. Come on. What's all that going on for? Because the devil wants your love to grow cold. I said the devil wants your love to grow cold. Because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. It's amazing. We are seeing every one of those things happening, aren't we? But let's don't see our love grow cold. He who endures, what's he talking about? In context there, he's talking about love. Love has to endure. Suzanne said to me this morning, she said, I was reading some of your old notes, and she said, without love we are nothing. That's exactly right. Without love we are nothing. Boy, there's a lot of people think they're something. 
But they're not the judge. God's the judge. We need to walk in love. People sometimes say, we've all heard this, Jesus is the reason for the season. No, love is the reason for the season. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God's love planned our redemption before Adam was even created. Some people think that if God knew what he did, know that what Satan was going to do and what Adam and Eve would do, why did he allow it? Well, everybody has free will, including the devil. Doesn't mean what they do is legal, but they have free will. And you see, God planned for it. God was not caught off guard. And what we have, some people say, well, you know, Adam had all that. No, you, we got something better than Adam had. Adam did not have God in him, the hope of glory. He was created by God, but God wasn't in him. We had to be born again. So God had something better for us than he had for Adam, although some people think they'd like to have what Adam had, but I'd rather have what I have. Amen? We call him Lord and Father. Adam just called him Creator. For God so loved the world, the reason for the season is love. The Word of God became flesh because He loves us. He died because He loves us. He lived a sinless life because He loves us. So the reason for His coming was love. And now we are to manifest the love of God to the world. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. But later on, he said, you're the light of the world. He said, you're salt and light. He's gone, but he's in us. And the only love the world's going to see is through us. And if our love grows cold, think how cold the world's going to be. The dumb world's worried about global warming. They ought to be worried about global colding. Amen. That's the devil's plan for the, your love to grow cold. Don't let it. You know, the Bible says that we were born again, Romans chapter 8, verse 4, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. What's the righteous requirement of the law? Well, they ask Jesus, what does the law say? He says, it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might and love your neighbor as yourself. He said, these are the, the two most important commandments. In fact, whether we like it or not, he said in the second, as important as the first. That the righteous requirement of the law, see... Obviously, the Lord said this to me last week. He said, Adam and Eve didn't love God. If they'd have loved God, they wouldn't have done what they did. They'd have said, get out of here, devil. I serve God and him only. But see, the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts so that we can serve him and that we can, we can manifest his love. You can all full manifest your flesh, but you're supposed to manifest his love. Bible says, put on the new man. Well, who are you going to, you got to put it on over the old man. God does not want the old man out in public. God doesn't want the old man saying, put on the new man, which is created in righteousness and true holiness. Never let it be said, I know your works are neither hot nor cold. That's a dangerous position. Lukewarm. Lukewarm's a dangerous position. Especially in these last days. We are to walk in love and manifest the goodness of God that's been shed abroad in our hearts. We're to worship Him. 
We're to honor him and serve him. We were created to worship God and to glorify him. Amen? We are here to glorify God. Amen? So that's the quest answer to the question, what are we going to say on Christmas? I've said it. <laughs>